it was uh, interesting to listen to different aspects about the decarbonization and uh, burning fuels and carbon footprints. So my general question to open to all of you is, what are the latest technologies which are driving decarbonization efforts in the aerospace and defense sector? To start with Mr. Menon. Um, I, let me talk only about the defense for a change because maybe out of the three panelists, I have a little bit more uh, insight into the defense sector. Again, I will start with a, sort of a disclaimer here. Uh, the motivation in the defense sector to, to go in for too much of decarbonization and too suddenly is, is not of the highest level, to be very frank. I mean, worldwide, uh, because the defense sector is meant to act swiftly. Uh, they're not a profit-making organization. They don't have to worry about costs. I think they're a very small organization considering the overall population. So they believe that their impact on the overall environmental uh, stuff would be much less, et cetera, et cetera. So, so quite frankly, the motivation may not be very high. But, but that said, it does not mean that a lot of efforts are not being put in. Uh, I can talk about one or two uh, areas where serious efforts are. The first and foremost is uh, aviation fuel. Uh, so sustainable aviation fuel, or, or also known as SAF in short, is something that on which a lot of research has gone on. Uh, I am aware that Rolls-Royce has tied up with um, the UK uh, Air Force, the Royal Air Force, uh, to actually, um, they have completed the first flight of a military fighter aircraft, uh, which is 100% uh, run on SAF. So, you know, uh, that, that's, that's uh, definitely uh, one area. Uh, the second area is the type of uh, materials and, and the specifications of those materials itself. I remember a time uh, about uh, 30, 40 years back um, on ships when we were told that all new ships or all new cables that will have to be, uh, that are coming on board ships and ships have tons and tons of, of cables, mind you. Uh, they all have to come with an environmental uh, friendly component. Okay, that is if, for example, if there is a fire, uh, this will not add more, uh, you know, uh, carbon monoxide and, and other gases to the fire. There was a willful change. Uh, it started with uh, a requirement to safeguard your personnel from, from toxic uh, fumes, but then it later on became lighter cables. It became more environmental friendly cables, et cetera, et cetera. So at least on board ships, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, aspect. And uh, the other thing that I touched upon in my speech again was efficiency of engines, uh, be it ships or be it aircraft. Uh, definitely uh, bringing in more efficient engines will have that much impact, even if it is a 10%, 20%, 18% uh, uh, is what uh, the GTF engines claims, will have a tremendous impact on the kind of uh, uh, you know environmental uh, that these engines can actually have. Uh, these are some two, three things that, that immediately I can think of. Thank you, Mr. Menon, for sharing your viewpoints. Uh, can we have your views, Mr. Achante? Yeah, uh, I think uh, contrary, uh, I would also like to share our experience, uh, especially because we are in the robotics world. And uh, we make a lot of, uh, we are trying to make a lot of ground support equipment uh, for different airport operations and air force. So it's actually uh, overwhelming and very happy uh, scene where uh, we work very closely with air force and uh, they are definitely uh, taking some good actions uh, that we see right from, uh, you know, aircraft tugging uh, kind of systems where uh, traditional tractors, uh, diesel run tractors are replaced with, uh, you know, robotic systems, which are battery based and can be charged to solar energy uh, uh, where you can move the aircraft and it, uh, you know you don't have don't need the aircraft engine running up and running all the time uh, for right from runway to hangar etc uh, then we also are coming up with sustainable uh, uh, you know uh, cleaning systems for aircrafts where you know traditional systems of manual or you know water based uh, you know where you can reduce the cleaning of the aircraft from uh, with less eight times lesser water usage uh, for cleaning of the aircraft and decreasing of the aircraft using a better efficient uh, robotic system um, and also uh, things like uh, refueling right I mean uh, you know how you can have better refueling systems where you don't need uh, diesel oriented bowsers and uh, you know trucks coming in uh, to the air, air, airports to act
fuel in the petrol into the uh, or uh, sorry uh, aviation fuel into the aircrafts so activities are happening technology adaptation has actually gone up uh, it good side to see uh, right now and um, and the awareness, uh, be it Air Force, civil aviation, or uh, different services, uh, the awareness has actually gone up with respect to carbonization and how they can reduce that. Yes, definitely. We are moving towards the sustainability efforts and reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, Mr. Rashekar Uchil, can we have your views, please? Right, right. Some of the important things that we see a lot and which we don't realize is happening is, for example, when we look at airports and self-sufficiency, we said Cochin Airport is now fully green. Another thing which airports are also doing is improving on the building management system. As you know, the airport, all airports are inherently a closed system. So a more efficient building management system helps in energy conservation, energy monitoring. You have variable frequency driving for all the pumps and motors. You have temperature control so that you have optimum usage of your refrigerants. So these are all aspects which go on reducing your carbon footprint as well as energy conservation. Another thing is also flow monitoring. So when aircraft, or, or, or I should say, for example, Bangalore Airport, which buys water from external sources, you have flow meters which monitor the actual fuel consumption and the water consumption. So you know exactly what you are paying for. So these are some of the technologies. The other one is, of course, from the aircraft design. But today, uh, right from the helicopters and the LCAs, uh, both Mr. Satish and Ravi Chandran will bear that with the use of composites in the LCA, your metal usage has come down. Your aircraft have become much lighter in terms of both volume and weight. And there's a lot of technology which is going on. This other one is, of course, the digital twin concept. So it improves your entire design cycle. So uh, you know, 35 years back when we worked on the PSLV, all the calculations of comparison of your NASTRAN or ANSYS model were literally done on the notebook. I was sitting with the VSSC engineers when they were looking at the value on the oscilloscope, looking at a man, uh, notebook and say, okay, I got this value in my FEA. How good is your practical model? Now I can compare both of these in a single screen and say, okay, look, my FEA analysis gave this value. This is my actual model analysis, frequency response. It improves and speeds up your entire cycle. Your test cycles have improved. Uh, another important thing, which is on the heat treatment. There's lots of heat treatment in the aerospace industry. So people have today improved in terms of thyristors, temperature control system, so that your entire furnace efficiency is talking of uh, you know, a two, even a 2% or 3% efficiency in furnaces, which are thousands of kilowatts, improves your energy monitoring, improves your energy payback. And that's where technology has come. You, you record, you monitor, you control. That's where automation comes. And then today, when we look at all the automation companies' concept of sensor to boardroom, so even the CEO of a large aircraft company like Boeing or Airbus can sit and look at what's the energy consumption, what's the monitoring for the day, how much is the fuel consumption, how much is the saving. This huge play a thrust on energy. And today with the BE laws, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency laws and similar laws worldwide, everyone is bothered about how I can decrease my energy consumption. The rules of energy conservation have come into industrial buildings like an uh, Air Force. So every airport is also saying, yes, instead of, you know, maybe 100 megawatts, can I reduce it to even 95 megawatts? That's a huge saving by uh, in, uh, putting all these technologies in place. This is some of the things that I would say. Obviously, sustainable aviation fuel, India started it almost a year back. In 23, the first flight took place. And again, there the calculation is, even if you are reducing the imported fuel and India imports all the aviation fuel. So if I can reduce it by even 1% per year, it's, it's a huge savings for India if I can do a substitution with the SAF fuel. So the, those are some of the trends which are going on. Yeah, definitely. You, you have put the aspects in a very uh, livid manner. And record monitoring and control is the essence of decarbonization, as you mentioned, for Mr. Ravi. Coming to you, 
how to address the challenge in scaling up the sustainable aviation fuels in decarbonizing the industry? I think I uh, touched some of the points uh, during my uh, 10 minutes uh, of time. Uh, I think uh, one is the, uh, firstly, understanding the policy and regulation, right? I mean, what does the, uh, uh, you know, International Civil Aviation Organization and your MOCA, Ministry of Civil Aviation, um, how are they defining their policies? How are they in, in incentivizing, uh, you know, the companies for adopting such practices, especially SAF uh, kind of, uh, you know, very critical, uh, uh, critical technologies uh, that, you know, how they can incentivize because end of the day, uh, it's carbon decarbonization, definitely, but also uh, airlines and OEMs would also like to understand how they can balance the profits, uh, their balance sheets, and because that becomes a critical aspect. So some kind of in incentivizing in their policy and regulations would definitely help. Uh, second is the doc option of SAF, SAF itself, uh, right? You know, we don't know how many, uh, like, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rajshika mentioned the last year, there was a successful flight in India. So I think SpiceJet did that, if I'm not wrong, or using a biofuel. I think uh, that that definitely is encouraging, but how much of that can be adopted? And how much even the regular passengers should be made aware of, right? I mean, because uh, the people who are using uh, aircrafts every day or regularly uh, in their for their jobs or their personal travel, they should also be comfortable in traveling uh, in, with aircrafts with biofuels or SAFs. Uh, so that education, that awareness within the general public is also kind of very, very important. And then, uh, you know, uh, end of the day, uh, how you ensure that the SAF production itself is uh, kind of, uh, you know, reduce, uh, you know, high high cost of the production and the supply chain readiness uh, for getting the sourcing the raw material for SAF uh, and, and having it in different places. You know, you can't just have one plant at one place and say it will serve for everybody else, right? So how we can uh, reproduce that with uh, logical costing uh, and having that supply chain readiness is something that, uh, you know, I think future startups and new companies should think about uh, because at the end of the day, SAFE is nothing but recycling of, uh, you know, different waste uh, that you can make into, generate into a aviation fuel, right? Uh, so all those uh, things that uh, are needed to be in place uh, and someone has to uh, drive this as a policy, as a regulation, uh, and so that, uh, you know, it becomes better from an adoption perspective uh, across all the entire uh, globally, you know. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ravi. Uh, it has to be adopted and awareness has to increase about right. the SAFs. Uh, yeah. Coming to Mr. Satish Menon, you are majorly from the defense. So how are the major defense companies addressing the decarbonization in the military operations or the aircrafts? Few areas I think I already uh, touched upon was uh, uh, the, the SAF, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm definitely aware of uh, the Rolls-Royce engine in the Royal Air Force, uh, where uh, they did use uh, the SAF uh, based on biofuel. Uh, so th that's, a, that's a big uh, area. Um, a second area, as you might uh, also have seen, drones and uh, UAVs uh, are becoming mm -hmm. a major uh, focus area for, for most defense forces and most certainly the Indian defense forces. And, and, and drones and UAVs uh, use uh, sustainable fuels. I mean, most of them, they use either batteries or uh, solar powered, etc., etc. So I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, like I said, the, the the motivation the defense force as far as their fighting forces concerned the forces that have to really uh, be on the ground uh, go across borders etc cetera, etc cetera, may not be as high as as one would have expected that's my uh, personal feeling but definitely introduction of these kind of things like uh, uaes and uh, drones are a big step and more and like i mentioned uh, a lot of the components that go into the aircraft as well uh, starting from cables to the materials for the aircraft uh, and of course to the engines uh, are all they all play a vital role uh, in ensuring uh, you know that uh, sustainable ways are introduced in the in the defense forces and i'm talking specifically about the the fighting uh, machines um, uh, i think mr ravi touched upon a lot uh, that is as far as the ground support and various other aspects are concerned uh, I think put together all these things, even if they can reduce 20-25% uh, of uh, carbon emissions, I think it, it would be a great achievement by itself. Definitely. 
you know, quite right in putting that point. So Ravi has a point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Sorry, uh, specific yeah. to the TTBW, uh, I think it's a, a reference to the Boeing Aurora Flight X six G six. I think that's that was touched upon uh, by Mr. Rajshekar and also Mr. Manan on how uh, advanced materials, uh, you know, can definitely help in reducing the weight. Uh, also, when you're designing the aircraft, uh, how aerodynamic can you make it? Uh, or multiple simulations and design simulations uh, that you have to do. Um, all this definitely will contribute, uh, you know, uh, exactly how much uh, is, uh, is to be evaluated because these are still at very nascent stages. Uh, but uh, main, I think one of the main uh, areas where airlines or aircraft manufacturers can focus is the interiors because um, obviously uh, passenger experience and passenger luxury is definitely something that is that airlines and aircraft manufacturers don't like to compromise but within that uh, how you can use better material because these are not impacting directly the performance or the structural elements of the aircraft rather these are on the non-performing uh, elements of within the aircraft uh, you know on how you can reduce the pitch size of the seat uh, by using lighter material or lesser wet material but giving the same strength how you can have a better honeycomb structures in your interior wall designs uh, of the aircraft uh, where you can reduce the weight instead of a sheet in, imagine a honeycomb structure actually replacing the uh, material uh, or the wall structure on the uh, sides of the aircraft so all this uh, especially interiors has a better scope uh, as a straight uh, adoption compared to, uh, you know, the structural and which uh, actual wings and etc. where uh, the uh, qualification and uh, the adoption time is much larger. So, so yeah, it's, it's, we need to evaluate what are the win-wins. I think uh, that's what the airlines and aircraft manufacturers are better positioned to do. Uh, what is a quick win and what is a long-stretched uh, goal? Uh, that they need to achieve to end of the day uh, work on the designs and aerodynamism of the aircrafts uh, to achieve the uh, you know a decarbonization effort. Um, uh, just a quick point uh, to add, uh, nothing more than yes. what others have spoken. But I will go back to what I mentioned at the starting of my small topic uh, at the beginning. The most mm -hmm. important aspect in civil aviation is safety. So if yeah. you were to ensure safety okay. of your passengers, safety of your flight, it requires tremendous amount of proving, reproving, re-reproving, lot of stuff. Okay, so 2050 to me looks rather uh, far-fetched uh, to achieve uh, the zero emissions. Maybe 2070, like Mr. Ravi said, uh, is more like it. Uh, and maybe technologies will change by then. For example, we are not even talking about nuclear technology. Uh, you know, you could have modular uh, nuclear reactors, small miniature minis, micros, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which could be uh, run anywhere. You know, so so those are things that would probably uh, help as well in the coming years. Yeah, very nice, very nice point. So, and Mr. Ravi, you have touched about the interiors as well as exteriors. Interior point is that uh, lightweight material has to be used. Right. Uh, so while talking about the safety aspects, as Mr. Sun. Uh, Manon was telling, uh, what are the measures which can be adopted for the operational efficiency to reduce the carbon emissions? I think, uh, again, these are some of the points we already discussed. Uh, uh, there are uh, aspects that are being worked upon, uh, you know, like uh, I think uh, it was Mr. Rajshekar who mentioned, or Mr. Menon, sorry, who mentioned, uh, nobody accounts for how much fuel is burned when the aircraft is taxiing from uh, the parking uh, to the runway, right? Um, and also there are other elements where once the aircraft lands, how soon can you do a turnaround uh, with respect to inspection, uh, with respect to uh, you know your refilling process, and having so many vehicles coming? You see, in a typical uh, you know when you're boarding the aircraft, you can see at least five six vehicles surrounding the aircraft, right? And what you can do uh, with respect to increasing the efficiency of faster turnaround. Uh, so that, you know, the way, uh, aircraft and the number of vehicles utilized is reduced. 
and uh, there is operational efficiency that goes up uh, with respect to turning around the aircraft faster because that's money. Uh, aircraft doesn't earn uh, or airlines don't earn money when the aircraft is grounded, right? They earn money the more the aircraft is in the air, uh, the better uh, the revenues. So uh, that's where, uh, you know, while you're not compromising uh, the operational, like Mr. Menon said, safety, uh, I, I think... Uh, this is the one industry where right from your supply chain to your airlines, everywhere safety and compliance is very at the highest level. I think no other industry you'll find it so strict um, with respect to uh, co conduct and meeting the compliance requirements. So keeping that in mind, uh, how you can increase the operational efficiency using better systems and faster inspection systems. Uh, you know, like for example, we, we are adopting something uh, using a computer vision and lasers uh, for uh, detecting or completing the inspection of your underbelly of the aircrafts and wings and engines uh, in much faster way uh, compared to a typical, uh, you know, uh, human being, for example, uh, using battery operated and solar powered systems. So, so stuff like this uh, where, you know, you can, you need to understand where you can reduce uh, and also at the same time, not compromising on the compliance and safety uh, is something that airlines and air, especially airports uh, operators have to work towards. Definitely safety and cyber things are the point to be considered. They have to be given priority. Coming to the one of the last questions, because each of you has mentioned about the propulsion technologies. So my question is, could propulsion technologies such as electric or be it hydrogen or hybrid system can contribute to decarbonization in the airport, air space industry? Electric propulsion is already in the way. There is a, a startup in IIT Chennai which has already developed the e-plane. I believe now it, the next step is they are looking at VC is willing to put money to put this in a commercial manner. There are also, I think, large technologies being used by the bigger companies also on trying to get aircraft to run on EV. Again, the caution, please note that just like in a car, you say the EV is power friendly. The EV is still going to get powered from somewhere else. Is that power, you know, carbon neutral? If you are going to power your EV from a thermal power plant, then what is the sense? No. <laughs> only the fact that you power that your car runs from point A to point B on a battery, but the powering of your car when it comes to your house it is going to be charged by a thermal power plant. Then what? I, you have not contributed anything to the EV part. Also, the fact that everyone has now found out that all the rare materials used in batteries in EV, the mining of that is tremendously environmentally unfriendly. So, you know, you spoil a lot of areas of the ground by digging out lithium and all the rare materials. You don't bother because it comes here. But then when you look at environmental friendliness, what have you achieved? You say deforest an entire Amazon basin in Brazil because that's the only place the lithium is found. Yes, but you don't realize it. You get the lithium free. So you have damage somewhere else in the earth for, for your car in India. Just to, uh, just to add uh, add to that point of Mr. Rajshikar, yes, I think, uh, you know, from an electric propulsion point of view, uh, I was part of, in my previous company, I was part of uh, one of the projects uh, in electric propulsions. Uh, what it what has been observed is that there was an extensive study. Uh, uh, please understand that, you know, Rolls-Royce or Airbus or Collins Aerospace, this kind of companies would not get into these technologies unless there is an extensive research that's been done. Um, and uh, what has been observed as a simple logic is that where do you have maximum thrust uh, required by an aircraft, right? I mean, it's predominantly during takeoff that you need maximum thrust and maximum burning of fuel. And once you're in the uh, altitude that is required, it's all about cruising from there to the point B that you're reaching out. Uh, so there has been a lot of power study that's been uh, distribution study that's been done on how uh, aircraft can use minimal power uh, during cruising and landing and how the thrust is required at the initial stage and how converting that to electric uh, will give you better benefits and lesser carbon footprint. Uh, so that's that studies have been done and those are available online as well. Uh, I think anybody interested can dig in uh, into, the, into those research. And uh, yeah, that's definitely adds um, to the point that, you know, lesser fuel consumed uh, is lesser uh, carbonizing of environment. Maybe have your point of view, Mrs. 
Madam? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I already mentioned about the drones and UAV. So we already yeah. have them in huge numbers in the in the aerospace uh, uh, sector. And uh, lithium ion, uh, you know, we all know it, it, it's very, very, it's really not environmental friendly from a manufacturing perspective and more importantly, from a disposal perspective. They are extremely bad for the for the earth. So 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 these are uh, some uh, important aspects. And like I'm hoping, uh, nuclear technology could be something that might really really uh, come on big time. I know in this budget there are some a uh, lot of uh, money allocated by the Indian government on modular reactors, but maybe uh, spin-offs of that could be much smaller ones, micros and minis. So let's hope for that as well. Yeah, definitely, gentlemen. We had very nice and interactive session and new points, MRs, glaring facts were there, and matter for research into new technology uh, is the need of the time.